Murphy Complex wildfire, which burned about 600,000 acres of rangeland in southern Idaho and Nevada, is serving as a key catalyst in shaping western fire policy. After touring the Murphy Fire Zone recently, Interior Secretary Sally Jewell was inspired to develop a new firefighting strategy to prevent more large wildfires in the Great Basin. We went out onto China Mountain and looked out over Brown's Bench at some pretty incredible sagebrush habitat and looked out over the devastating effects of the Murphy Complex fire, which you can see from up there. And, uh, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, being there is worth even more, where you understand what's at stake. Jewel wants to protect the best remaining sagebrush steppe habitat for the greater sage grouse, a candidate for listing as an endangered species. Fire is the number one threat to this ecosystem in the Great Basin states. Governor Otter and I and the other western governors that are working on sage grouse conservation plan uh, are really working on the preservation of the sagebrush steppe ecosystem. There are 350 species that depend on that habitat. Mule deer, uh, pronghorn, the greater sage grouse, yes, but also the bald eagle and, and many other species that call this home. Ranchers also want to preserve the native perennial grasses and shrubs in the Great Basin because healthy rangelands provide the best quality forage for livestock grazing. Plus, public land grazing allotments are a crucial part of most ranching operations. Rancher Mike Geary explains. We're what we call a patchwork outfit in that we've, there's private, there's state permits, there's BLM, there's Forest Service, but it's all key. You take one piece out of the puzzle and the operation doesn't work. Jewell's new wildfire prevention strategy, signed in Boise at a press conference with Governor Butch Otter, makes stopping wildfires in the Great Basin the number one national priority. The secretarial order affects five states and 42 million acres of private, state, and public land. A cornerstone of Jewell's strategy calls for working closely with ranchers as first responders via rangeland fire protection associations, to give firefighters a better chance of stopping rangeland fires when they're small. The fire prevention strategy also includes creating fire breaks along existing dirt roads with dozer works and mowing vegetation, pre-positioning firefighters and firefighting equipment close to core sage grouse habitat, creating more rangeland fire protection associations in the Great Basin and providing more resources for them, Idaho Governor Butch Otter applauded Secretary Jewell for beefing up RFPAs for initial attack. We now have five organizations that are out there representing 230 uh, ranchers uh, that are initial attack, that live out in the resource and uh, cover about three and a half million acres. Ranchers create the local RFPA organizations. The Idaho Department of Lands and BLM train them, provide firefighting clothing and communications, and they all work together when a wildfire occurs. It's really, truly about the partnership with the, with the BLM firefighters and the Idaho Department of Land firefighters. Classic example, two years ago, we had a night when we had 21 starts from Clover Creek to Ridgefield in a, in a huge lightning storm, and uh, that's probably about a 50-mile girth. And we had 11 of those in our, within our RFPA. And because of the fact we were able to spread out with, with our people and the BLM's people and all of our hard assets, and we bring a lot of hard assets to the party as well, we were able to hold all of those with the largest becoming 4,000 acres. Uh, the next, 24 hours later, we had a 60 mile an hour wind and every one of those fires helped. And I think that's the proof in the pudding right there is what everybody's talked about here, about catching the fires early. The big problem, Gary and Jewel point out, is that because of drought and climate change, wildfires have been getting bigger and bigger every year, and they're burning more frequently too. When you come like I did out of the 60s, when we had 3,000 acre fires, into the 80s when we had 30,000 acre fires, to the 2000s when a small fire in the garbage resource area is a couple hundred thousand acres, and a large fire is, as uh, Governor Otter alluded to, the 660,000 Murph acre Murphy complex fire. The reality is, um, we have longer, hotter fire seasons than we ever have before. 
In the BLM's Jarbage Resource Area, for example, where Gary runs cattle and sheep, repeated wildfires have burned up valuable sage steppe habitat. Julie Hilty of the BLM explains. This map shows fire frequency in the Jarbage Field Office over the last 15 years. This pink color shows areas that burned once. Um, and essentially this, this very large area shows the extent of the Murphy Complex fire that happened in 2007. Overlaid on that, you see some darker colors that show other repeated fires. Starting in 2005, we had um, several large fires. Clover Fire burned about 170,000 acres. Sailor Cat burned about 100,000 acres in 2006. Murphy Complex over 600,000 acres in 2007. Um, Longview Fire, which burned from this side of the field office to this side of the field office um, in 2010 was over 300,000 acres. And then the Kenyon Fire burned from down here over to here in 2012 and that was over 200,000 acres. So we've had this extensive, repeated fire cycle. While the BLM does its best to restore the land following wildfires, it can take years for sagebrush and other shrubs to grow back. Plus, invasive species like cheatgrass and other exotic plants quickly take root after fires and outcompete native vegetation. That's why sage grouse conservation plans list wildfire and the spread of invasive species as the number one and number two threats to sage grouse habitat. In my mind, prevention's a lot better investment than fighting fires and, and doing rehab. If we can catch them before they get big and you know, strategize projects to keep, keep fires small, we're gonna be dollars ahead. A map of core sage grouse habitat in Idaho and the Great Basin shows that the stronghold of the bird populations are in areas where the native sage steppe habitat still exists, shown in purple. These are the areas that Secretary Jewell wants to preserve with the new fire prevention strategy. Ron Dutton of NIFSI explains how the BLM is gearing up for the first year of implementation in Idaho and four other states that comprise the Great Basin. We're pushing those resources into five states buying extra dozers, buying extra water tenders, buying extra tractor trailer rigs. The BLM will be positioning smoke jumpers, hotshot crews, and incident commanders close to the Great Basin in hot summer months. I'm real confident in our ability to mobilize quickly, to move quickly. The Secretary's strategy also calls for creating 9,000 miles of fuel breaks in the Great Basin. The fuel breaks are being created along existing dirt road corridors with blading and mowing. These, the fires that are getting away from us are going bigger, faster than they've ever gone before. So we need a fuel break system that's gonna take that into effect. So that's why we need to go bigger. In, the, in this fuel type, in the sagebrush, um, you know, fire can move through that at eight to 14 feet flame length. Now, and that's the reason to manipulate the sagebrush and to mow it. So when fire comes out of that sagebrush that hasn't been mowed and into the mow strip, it's gonna drop that flame length down to something that's easier to handle. That's that break point where we as firefighters can more safely engage. BLM contract crews are working on creating fire breaks in core sage grouse habitat areas throughout Southern Idaho. Brandon Brown shows a 200 foot fire break along Grassy Hills Road in the Three Creek area. When this burned in the Murphy complex, um, this was all tall, really tall sagebrush, and the flame lengths were were immense. I mean, it it, it jumped the road in, in multiple spots. There was really no way to, to to defend this this area. It wasn't safe. So now, when we have a wider road corridor to work from, and then we have the vegetation knocked down, um, it, it'll make a drastic effect on the flame lengths. It'll drop the flame lengths as it approaches the road, as the fire approaches the road. So our crews can actually fight fire along the road. They can do burnout operations safely and without the flames actually jumping the road. Another key part of the Secretary's strategy is to stage firefighting equipment with Rangeland Fire Protection Associations, or RFPAs. 
Mike Gary, gives a rundown of the fire engines at his ranch in the Three Creek area. So this is our commitment to the Rangeland Fire Protection Association and what equipment we provide to the association. We have many members that provide different pieces of equipment. This is what we provide. We provide two tra tractors and discs, the other, and they're used right on the fire. This next piece is our water tender. When we're out there, the BLM has water tenders as well, but if we get a multiple start night, there aren't very many water tenders. And so it can be real critical when you're out there on a fire how far you have to go with those engines to get water. And so if we can provide water tenders, this one will fill three different three engines. Carries enough water, carries 2,700 gallons. So if we can get water staged close enough to the fire, those engines don't have to come off the fire line very long. And that's key. Because key to these fires in this grassland that we've developed out here now is catching them quick. This is our, our private fire engine. It holds 900 gallons of water. Uh, it's all set up. It's got uh, the fire pump and hoses on the other side. We've got 10 flat lines we can run clear down into a canyon, probably almost a quarter of a mile uh, with line if we'd have to. This pickup's been set up for that, to fuel the, the tractors or the graders when they're out there. We've got uh, a generator and air compressor set up in it along with the tools that we need in order to service that piece of equipment and leave it ready for the next day. My gear is in it. So I don't have to wonder where it is when a fire starts. I can, I can jump right in and, and go. I've got it with me. And it's set up communication-wise as well. Gary explains how the firefighting resources will be staged at strategic points throughout the 1.1 million acre Three Creek RFPA during the fire season. This is where we're located currently, and this is where the fire truck and pickup will jump off from. Our first tractor disc is Simplots right here in this private ground, and the water tender will be here on this piece of private ground. My first tractor and disc will be located right here at the Clover Horse Butte Road. The second one will be here at Coonskin Butte. Mike Hensley will have a tractor and disc here on his private ground and a grader over here on Grassy Hill and the remainder of the assets will come out from the ranching area up on this south end of the district. The third prong of Secretary Jewell's strategy is to dramatically expand post-fire restoration activities in the Great Basin. Three types of restoration are planned. One, planting grasses and sagebrush immediately following burns to restore plant communities. Two, converting old cheatgrass fields to diverse plant communities. And three, removing invading juniper trees from mountain meadow habitat to open up use of those areas for sage grouse. The scope of work that's being identified in that 42 million acres is roughly, we need to do about 10 million acres of restoration work, which is a huge magnitude of work for BLM. One of the poorest parts of the secretarial order is to start looking at large scale treatments to turn back cheatgrass. A lot of people will say, well, we just, it's just too big, we can't do that, you know, we'll never stop it. Well, if we don't, we lose the whole basin, so we've got to figure out a way. The BLM recently showcased a project that converted 16,000 acres of cheatgrass and exotic weeds to perennial grasses and sagebrush north of Burley. This is the Kamima restoration project, and what we had here um, about 15 years ago was pretty much a monoculture of cheatgrass and annual invasive weeds. And through a series of treatments that took a couple of years, um, we were able to restore that. And the intent was to, to reestablish perennial grasses and sagebrush component on the landscape. And what we did was a drill seeding for the perennial grasses and an aerial sagebrush seeding. And this is the result we have 15 years later. The Kamima site is pretty dry with only about 8 to 10 inches of precipitation per year. The elevation is 4,300 feet above sea level. But we built a lot of resiliency back into this landscape. So, you know, what we see now is this is on a, a, a better ecological trajectory. A couple of goals, and one is to um, establish connectivity to existing habitat to the north on Crater's uh, Monument. And there's really good habitat there, and what we've been able to do with this project is expand that habitat. By getting rid of the cheatgrass, the perennial plant communities will be more resistant to fire as well. 
by establishing this area, we're, we were able to provide an area for as a kind of a, a really extensive fuel break, almost a landscape level fuel break. Brown says projects like this could be done elsewhere in the Great Basin with good success, but they do take time to recover. We plan on doing large scale projects like this so that we can actually have an impact on the landscape. The BLM Twin Falls District also recently worked on a juniper removal project to expand sage grouse habitat on Jim Sage Mountain. The project had support from the Sage Grouse Initiative and Idaho Fish and Game, among others, to improve habitat for the birds in mountain meadows. And this is a juniper reduction project that was started in the fall of 2013 and finished in the uh, winter, spring of 2014. We retreated around uh, about 5,000 acres. As you can see, that line, that hard line of uh, juniper trees, we took the project right up to that, and the trees were encroaching right up to, to where we're standing right now. And we used multiple methods. We used mastication, and we used a lop and scatter method. Masticators are heavy equipment that grind up juniper trees into wood chips. And the lop and scatter method is done by chainsaw. So shortly after we completed the project with the mastication, uh, we had some uh, crew members out here checking things out and they spotted sage grouse, a large number of sage grouse, right in the mastication project. The largest sage grouse lek in the Burley Field Office area is located about one mile away. BLM officials said the juniper removal project helped expand sage grouse habitat adjacent to existing habitat. Research shows that sage grouse won't use areas with juniper trees growing on them, fearing that predators such as ravens will hide in the trees and prey on their young. Junipers also consume large amounts of water in meadow areas and sterilize the soil around them, making it very difficult for plants or forbs to grow there. After the junipers are removed, native plants and forbs bounce back quickly and sage grouse move back into the habitat. In early June, Indian paintbrush and other forbs were sprouting in the mountain meadow. Both Secretary Jewell and Governor Otter are excited about the prospects for restoring public lands. The key to restoration activities is having consistent funding for it. The rehab is really important and the timeliness of rehab is important. The only way you're going to beat that cheatgrass is to get the right grasses grown to keep the cheatgrass uh, squeezed out. Idaho ranchers are excited about Secretary Jewell's strategy, too. I think it's awesome. I, I, it puts it on the map. It makes it a priority. Rangeland Fire Protection Association is recognized as a priority in the eyes of the federal government. Everything we can do to help that agency and these ranchers work together and, and have get those first boots on the ground quicker is going to put us in a better position to get ahead of these fires. I can't thank uh, everybody enough for the incredibly hard work that uh, you are doing together to make sure that all of our lands, our range lands, as well as our forest lands, um, are recognized for the value that they bring to this state, this region, uh, and to the critters that don't have a vote, uh, because they're important too. They're important to all of us, and they're important to our children's future and our, our great-grandchildren's future as well. So.